Good morning. I'm Riel de Wilde, Business Development Manager at the Biobase, your pilot plant, which is all about turning grams into tons. Our company was founded in 2008 as a not-for-profit SME, and the reason for the structure is because we received all the investment budgets for the equipment we bought and installed from public instances like uh, the European uh, Commission, Flanders, the Netherlands, uh, which in the first couple of years totaled approximately 40 million euro. Currently, we're investing additional money, uh, which we mainly received from the Green Deal uh, European budget, um, totaling 20 million euro, including our own co-funding. This structure makes that we're fully independent. We don't have any industrial shareholders, which is very important to our customers for whom we are scaling up innovative, strategically important innovations. We're operational since 2010. And in the course of the years, we've grown to 178 employees. Uh, we've implemented quality management systems certified with ISO 9001 and the food grade FSSC 22000. We're also FDA registered. And we're located in Ghent, in Belgium. Uh, Ghent is a beautiful city, so our customers really like to visit us uh, when they attend the trials we perform for them. Our mission is to enable the transition towards a sustainable bio-based circular economy. And we do that through uh, providing three types of services, which is process development, scale up and custom manufacturing of bio-based products and processes. When we do process development, we work at bench scale or at 100 liter scale. We screen different unit operations, we perform feasibility testing, we calculate the first um, yields, uh, we characterize the final product before we choose to scale up um, certain unit operations that have proven to be successful. Scale up is done at 100 liter scale, 1 cubic meter, 10 cubic meter scale. Um, we produce samples for uh, application testing, we demonstrate the technology in scalable equipment because all the equipment we have is state-of-the-art equipment you can buy off the shelf. We gather process data, mass and energy balances, which we also provide to our customers. Once the process is optimized and scaled up, uh, we organize to, to produce um, commercial product which we do at our largest scale, which is currently approximately 10 cubic meter scale. Um, and so our customers can prepare to access larger scale CMOs or to construct their own industrial line. The picture you see here on the right is one of our 150 liter fermenters, um, which uh, Julie is operating. Our pilot plant is a one-stop shop. Um, which means we can turn biomass um, all the way into a refined bulk business-to-business -business product. So we can bring in the biomass, we have the logistics uh, to do that, we can pre-treat the biomass, we can perform a basic conversion like a biocatalytic or enzymatic conversion, a fermentation, including gas fermentation process, or a green chemical conversion involving organic solvents, for example. And we have a very wide set of downstream purification equipment um, at the different scales I just mentioned, bench scale, 100 liter, 1000 liter, and 10 cube, uh, 10,000 liter scale, um, before we fill off the final product um, in bulk. Some of the biomass feedstocks we process are the second generation lignocellulosics like wood, wheat straw, corn stover, miscanthus, etc. We also process macroalgae or industrial byproducts, co products from food industry or from agriculture. Um, since recently, we can also convert organic waste in a separate part of our plant, so not in the same equipment as in which we produce uh, food-grade materials. 
We can also use syngas as a feedstock, which is a mixture of CO2, CO and hydrogen, which we feed to our gas fermentation units. Uh, we can also process first generation feedstock like vegetable oils, glucose, sucrose or lactose, which we buy on the market. Some examples of final products we make um, are flavors and fragrances, specialty carbohydrates, chemical building blocks such as organic acids for, for example, bioplastics production. We have quite a number of biosurfactants projects, uh, which we also produce via fermentation. Um, we produce a number of enzymes, alternative proteins to replace animal proteins. We make colorants, nutraceuticals, and also technical products like solvents, fuels. We also work for pharmaceutical companies, but not to produce human um, drugs, drugs for human uh, use, but for example, for diagnostics applications or for process development. Um, we also have a number of projects in the ag tech space to produce biostimulants or pest control agents. <clears throat> we really want to help our customers bridge the gap in the innovation chain, which is called the value of death. Um, so this innovation chain typically starts with the basic research, um, which is done in the lab by our customers. So they develop a strain or an enzyme. Uh, or a process uh, for a green uh, chemical uh, conversion. Um, and we take this um, basic protocol, <clears throat> start with this strain, and uh, translate this to an industrial protocol in our state-of-the-art industrial equipment. Um, we scale up the process, um, generate the sample material, generate the mass balance and quality data, um, and by that time, our customers are um, ready to convince the market, to convince their investors that the process is economically viable before they then build their own industrial line or they go to a CMO. Uh, we have two types of projects. On the one hand, the bilateral service projects, which are fully confidential, so we cannot mention for which companies we work. We can only say we've done over 400 projects for over 200 companies, of which 33% is US-based. On the other hand, we also have consortium projects, which are typically funded um, within publicly uh, funded projects, uh, programs like Horizon Europe um, or Interreg or the Flemish Vlajo or Catalysti projects. We're currently partner in 34 um, such consortium projects, which make which makes that we have a very large network uh, across the innovation chain. What are the advantages of working with the shared service facility like ours as compared to building your own pilot or demonstration line? If you build your own pilot or demo plant, you will have to design it, which takes time you will have to construct it, which takes a long time. If you order, for example, a centrifuge today, you will receive it only in a year. You will have to spend a lot of capex. You will have to hire people and pay them, train them. Whereas if you partner up um, with a scale-up facility like ours, you don't have to design it, construct it or build it. You will just have to pay a service fee um, which can range anywhere between several tens of thousands of euros or dollars um, up to a few million euro, euro or dollars, which depends on um, the activities um, that, you, that we perform for you. Um, so if we perform the trials for you, they will be done faster, um, but also cheaper and better because we have so much experience in performing all kinds of scale-up projects. We're not the only shared service facility. Um, we coordinated a project, a European project called Pilots for You, uh, in which we built a database um, that um, gives access to all the open access pilot plans in Europe. So the basic message is relax, we have all the equipment you need. 
So this is an aerial picture of our facility, the Biobase Europe pilot plant. Um, we have four different uh, processing halls. In the first one, uh, we perform biomass pretreatment, purification and biocatalysis at 100 liter or 1000 liter scale. Um, you can see this is in a modular setup. Um, these unit operations are skid mounted, so very flexible. We build up a processing line um, based on the needs of each new project. Um, in our larger blue hull, which is 1000 square meters, um, we have our larger scale downstream purification equipment um, with which we can purify um, 10 tons of fermentation broth in a couple of hours or a couple of days. In the central building, we have our labs in which we perform tech transfer, bench scale process development and the analytics to follow up the production. Um, in the white hall, um, we installed all our aerobic fermenters, currently up to 15 thousand liters, 15 cubic meters, but we've bolted on a new building <laughs> in which we've recently lifted our 75 cubic meter bioreactor, which will be operational mid-24. So this is part of this um, new investment budget of uh, 29 million euros. In our um, green hull, we have our uh, ATEX or explosion proof zone and chemical reactors to perform green chemical conversions. We also have a new building um, for office space and customer hubs um, and events. Um, so the customer hubs are for our customers um, to have a place with internet connection to stay um, and be very close to the trials uh, we perform for them. When we step into the plant, uh, we see the equipment for biomass pretreatment. So we can do direct steam injection in our jet cooker here at the top. We can do organosolf acid alkaline pretreatments under pressure in our chemical reactors, which you see in the middle picture at the bottom. Uh, we perform enzymatic hydrolysis, solid liquid separations like in this decanter and all this at multi-ton scale. And the exact scale depends on the required uh, processing conditions and the process line we build up. For biocatalysis or enzymatic reactions, we perform aqueous two-phase or three-phase reactions. So the aqueous reactions can be done, for example, in these four times eight cubic meter tanks, of which you see in the, the internals here. These are temperature controlled, pH controlled and level controlled. So we can run batch, fat batch or continuous reactions. Um, these, this is the internals of one of our glass lined chemical react reactors for two phase or even three phase reactions. And we have, for example, this pedal mixer for high solids um, conversions. Um, the biggest reactors we have are 50,000 liters. Um, we can also produce enzymes, of course, uh, which we can then purify with, for example, this cross-flow um, ultra uh, filter, uh, which is a spiral wound unit of approximately 180 square meters. We can also immobilize enzymes and perform continuous biocatalytic conversions, um, and we can produce wholesale biocatalysts. Um, Fermentation is our core expertise. Um, we grow batch, fat batch, or continuous uh, fermentations. Um, we grow bacteria, yeast, fungal strains, and microalgae, typically in aerobic conditions. So we have very strong aeration on all these uh, fermenters, but we can also run anaerobic uh, fermentations. And as I mentioned, gas fermentation up to 150 liters. So our aerobic fermenters um, start in the range of um, at the bench top in, in glass bioreactors of 250 milliliters 
two liters, four liters and seven liters. So we have multiple reactors uh, at those scales to perform um, process development and medium optimization and aeration and feed strategy optimization. Um, furthermore, we can perform process development in eight 30 liter stainless steel reactors. Uh, so we invested also within this most recent investment budget in 30 liter um, stainless steel bioreactors because we wanted to de-risk fermentations um, at a, a scale as small as possible in stainless steel to make the process conditions as representative as possible. Then we often perform tech transfer and scale up runs in our 150 liter fermenters, of which we have 10. You can see six of them on this picture at the bottom left. We have a special 500 liter um, ISPR uh, fermenter, um, so we can do the in situ product recovery in a special uh, section at the top of the reactor in which, um, for example, aromatic or terpene compounds are extracted into an oil phase um, in a liquid-liquid continuous extraction. We can also couple this unit to our 15 cubic meter um, aerobic fermenters. Um, so we have um, five 1.5 cubic meter fermenters and three 15 cubic meter fermenters. <clears throat> and as I mentioned quite recently, we installed a 75 cubic meter fermenter, which you can see on this picture on the right. <clears throat> it's not yet commissioned. That will be the case in um, 2024. Um, in the field of gas fermentation, we have four one liter fermenters. We have a 10 liter gas fermenter and we have a containerized unit of 150 liters. Um, we installed this unit inside a sea container because we want to be able to place the reactor at the location where the gas is emitted. The container also has um, an electrolyzer which generates the hydrogen um, as an energy source for the gas fermentation process. The team you see here on the picture that works on the gas fermentation processes um, develops quite some uh, know-how and performs quite some basic research on this, uh, these processes uh, and has published uh, quite a number of articles on, for example, PHB production or coupled uh, fermentations um, with uh, CO2 to acetate and acetate via aerobic uh, fermentation to um, chemicals. Um, in our green chemistry hull, uh, so in our explosion proof zone, we have chemical reactors up to five cubic meters um, in which we can do esterifications, um, acid precipitations, uh, liquid liquids or solid liquid extractions, or biome has pretreatment reactions. We have a filter dryer, uh, a Nutsche type filter uh, of almost two cubic meters. Uh, for solid liquid extractions or crystal separation or washing um, in the presence of organic solvents, for example. We have a disk stack centrifuge uh, that separates the liquid phases very efficiently. We do crystallization, um, filtration. We have a car column for countercurrent liquid liquid extraction. We have this chamber filter press um, for solid liquid separations. Furthermore, in downstream purification, we have a very wide set um, of unit operations. For example, high pressure homogenizers for cell lysis at three different scales, high speed separators like this um, solid liquid disk stack centrifuge, um, of which we also have a number of units. In, in different scales. Um, we have a wide number of filtration uh, skids in dead end, uh, such as chamber filter press, plate and frame, bag filter, candle filters, but also cross flow filtration units um, in spiral wound ceramic or hollow fiber setup, ranging uh, micro, ultra, nano and RO filtration. We do ion exchange, activated carbon treatment, 
um, chromatography in um, columns like this, uh, these 300 liter columns. But again, there we also have a range of um, sizes. The solvent extraction um, was discussed in the explosion proof zone. Um, we also have aqueous evaporators um, like this falling film evaporator with a um, water evaporation capacity of five ton per hour and a scraped surface or wiped film evaporator with 250 liter per hour evaporation capacity of which we have um, two units. Um, we also do a lot of crystallization. Um, in the biggest line we have is uh, contains a four and a half cubic meter crystallizer with uh, a Henkel inverting filter basket centrifuge and this Louvre type um, drum crystal dryer. We also have a small spray dryer um, with 15 kilo per hour evaporation capacity and we work with quite a number of external partners for larger spray drying uh, capacities. We're also investing in a lot of um, purification equipment for microbial proteins. Um, we've um, acquired a SETI decanter, which efficient, efficiently um, separates yeast, a regular decanter for solid liquid separations, a nozzle centrifuge, um, a, um, an ultra, a second ultra nano filter to debottleneck um, the the one unit we already had. Um, additional intermediate scale ceramic micro and ultrafiltration and additional large scale um, microfiltration um, because we're doubling the 144 square meter units um, we already had in place. Um, we have um, several R&D teams that work on low TRL or technology readiness level projects. Um, so I already mentioned the gas fermentation projects they are working on. So they are taking this green hydrogen industrial emissions or biogenic CO2 or syngas, confer converting that via acetogens to acetate and feeding the acetate to aerobic um, yeasts or bacteria to produce fuels, bioplastics, platform chemicals. They're also using second generation sugars and feed them to yeast or bacteria to produce all kinds of materials, polymers, um, and also, for example, biosurfactants. Um, we've even um, started up um, a daughter company called Amphistar, which is a spin off company from the University of Ghent and the Biobase Euro pilot plant and they will market biosurfactant sophrolipids. Um, some examples of consortium projects um, we are or were a partner in. Um, within Silfeed, we converted wood or woody sugars to single cell protein, which was used for aqua feed. So we scaled up this process to 15 cubic meter scale. Within Rehab, BioHeart and Falcon, we converted different types of lignocellulosic feedstocks, for example, bark, wheat straw, miscanthus, um, via different pretreatment technologies to lignin, all kinds of aromatics, fermentable sugars, which we then again converted to chemical building blocks, uh, fuels, tannins. A smart box is a project that we coordinate in which another partner performs the computational engineering of oxidative enzymes, uh, which we then produce here, and we perform the one-step conversions of HMF to FDCA uh, or lignin to polycarbonate carbonate or vanillin, um, which we then also purify. Um, within repurpose, um, safe and sustainable by design plastics um, are developed. Um, our role within the project is um, to produce enzymes to depolymerize plastic waste, but also the fermentative production of glutaric acid from paper and cardboard derived sugars and 
muconic acid from lignin for further chemical conversion to diacids and diols to be used as building blocks for these novel um, the sustainable by design plastics. Waste to Funk is a project in which we convert supermarket waste to, for example, biosurfactants and lactic acid. And one of the partners within the project, eCover, um, which is a part of SC Johnson, um, has marketed um, a toilet cleaner and a multi-surface cleaner with these pro products within the um, Waste to Funk project. And all information about all our projects and our role in the projects and our partners can be found on our website. Um, on our YouTube channel, you can see some nice movies um, on how we run uh, projects, how we organize them. Uh, you can see many of our colleagues uh, starring in these movies, uh, which are very creatively um, produced by our communications team. Some examples of bilateral projects, um, so testimonials uh, from our customers. Um, the Scottish company Enough um, has disclosed that we scaled up their mycoprotein product up to our 15 cubic meter bioreactor scale. After this scale up, they received um, a grant to build a flagship demo plant, which is operational um, at the moment. Uh, in Sas van Gent, which is near uh, our plant here in Ghent. They will be producing 60,000 tons of um, this mycoprotein, uh, which is marketed under the name Abunda. Um, Imbios is a spin-off company from the University of Ghent. Um, they have a platform technology to produce human milk oligosaccharides, such as 2 fucosyl lactose, which can be used for, for example, infant nutrition, we also scaled up this product and many others for them um, and produced regulatory and market introduction samples. Evonik is a German multinational specialty chemicals company and we scaled up their Remno lipid biosurfactants, um, which they marketed uh, in 2019 already uh, with Unilever. And they are now constructing um, their own industrial plant in Slovakia. Povivi is a US-based company um, that produces biopheromones to fight the fall armyworm, which is a ma major pest in corn crop. We scaled up um, this technology for them up to our 15 cubic meter bioreactor scale. And after that scale up, they raised um, more than $45 million for the global launch of this product. Um, we've had um, a collaboration with ArcelorMittal already since 2012 um, to convert their steel mill blast furnace off gases uh, to chemicals. Um, they constructed um, um, an, a plant with four 1500 cubic meter uh, gas fermenters with which they will produce ethanol from blast furnace of gases. Uh, Celtic Renewables is also a Scottish company um, for whom we um, scaled up their ABE fermentation for the production of butanol from whiskey site products. Um, they are starting up their plant in Grangemouth in Scotland, and they've announced that they will be building a second plant to convert um, all kinds of site products to uh, butanol, which is a, an advanced fuel. Uh, Enzyme is a Swedish company um, that has um, um, continuous biocatalytic or cell-free uh, production of, for example, koji bios, which is a low calorie sugar. Um, and we also demonstrated the scalability of this uh, process. Alginor is a Norwegian company with a biorefinery concept of macroalgae, um, for which we also developed um, and optimized the production of various polysaccharides from this feedstock. And Biotalis is a spin-off company from the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology, 
um, that has an agrobody or nanobody technology um, to fight all kinds of pests in small fruit like strawberries, other berries or uh, grapes. Um, and they expect uh, approval of their first uh, product in the US and Europe this year. Um, we also organize quite a number of networking and coordination and support actions and projects to build partnerships within the biobased economy. I already mentioned the Pilots for You database, um, but we also have a Tech for Biowaste uh, database um, that we constructed within a consortium. Uh, it's a wiki page. Um, in which you can find uh, technology providers that um, can convert waste into uh, useful products. We've started the Protein Club um, initially as a regional initiative to bring many partners together active in the production of microbial um, proteins or fermentation-based proteins. Bioeconomy Ventures is a project to help SMEs find investors. Biobase Connect is a network of our customers and former customers um, whom we inform about um, potential projects, um, funding programs. Um, and on the 25th of September, we are organizing with several of these uh, partners the Pitch Perfect event in the Brussels uh, airport, um, to, to which you are very welcome um, still. And last but not least, this is our team. Um, a lot of ent enthusiastic people who are in very close contact with our customers uh, to prepare the trials, to discuss the trials, um, to discuss how we can proceed and help them scale up um, their bio-based innovation. If you're looking for a scale-up partner, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we'll be very happy to welcome you here in Ghent. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Muriel. Um, we will now, I will now turn it over to our Q&A monitor. Uh, James Gardner. Hey, Muriel. Muriel, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. We don't have a ton of question, a ton, ton of time for questions, but we want to dwell on the uh, contact slide for just one second. Uh, in that moment, I would like to ask you, you, you briefly mentioned characterization capabilities and would be curious to hear very briefly what kinds of characterization techniques, technologies you you have for all of your equipment? Yeah, typically we follow up our fermentation processes by HPLC. Uh, of course, of gas uh, analysis with uh, mass spec is uh, very important because it's uh, online, so very efficient. Um, we do enzymatic assays, uh, we do um, SDS page, we do, um, yeah, all the... Yeah, so mainly HPLC, I would say, and GC, Dynamex, UPLC. Okay, great. There was another uh, quick question uh, regarding your use of municipal solid wastes. I'm curious to hear if you have had any projects that use that, and maybe we can wrap it up. Yeah, but only the organic fraction, um, because then we use the sugars uh, to convert them via fermentation to um, those cleaning products. Okay. Uh, I would encourage uh, everyone to uh, reach out to Muriel with additional questions you may have. And, um, and with that, uh, thank you so much for the informative presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, before we move to our next speaker, um, I we realized that a lot of our attendees are joining in now. So I wanted to welcome them to the second session of our inaugural bioindustrial scale up and manufacturing facilities uh, hosted by the ABPDU. Uh, so for those of us who are just joining us, we are conducting this event to connect ABPDU's current collaborators with further scale up and manufacturing partners. Uh, if you are interested in learning about the ABPDU or more events like this, 
that the ABPD will be conducting, please visit our website and sign up for our newsletter. You will find the links in chat. You can also follow us on our LinkedIn. This event focuses on technical education of capabilities. As such, we will not be answering any business-related questions. At the same time, if the technical questions fall into the R&D category that involve potential intellectual property, the speakers may not be able to answer them in this public format. If we cannot answer a question in today's event, or if you want to request a copy of the presentation slides, please reach out to the speaker directly. You may have noticed that after every speaker completes their talk, we've, we've been pausing on their contact slide for one minute for you to take a picture or note the contact information as necessary. To our speakers, again, thank you very much for taking the time and presenting to our collaborators. We appreciate it very, very much. Uh, please ensure that you're sharing public information only. Um, a rule of thumb would be only share information that you're comfortable putting on a brochure. Uh, I am Deepti Tanjore. I'm your host for this session. And my Q&A monitor is James Gardner, who you just heard from. And now we'll move to our next speaker, Matthias Hobby from Gaia. Okay, then we are set, I believe. Um, thank you very much, uh, Deepti, and uh, welcome everybody from my side. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's my time is already evening. I'm my, my name is Matthias Hobby. I'm um, based in Germany, and um, I'm um, head of R and D technology within Gea, new food company Gea. And uh, New Food is a global business unit, and we are enabling our customers with application centers. And of course, we are delivering entire lines to our customers, and we have a strong focus now for a couple of years on what we call New Food, which is sustainable food to feed the world more sustainably. And the big part of our role is um, to run or to to bring our application centers to life and to operate them. Uh, but before I really talk about the what, the who, the where, and the how, I really need to talk about the why. Um, so why um, GEA is on this journey, why new food? Now, you can look yourself around in the world, what's happening in the news every day. You can talk to colleagues and you will be hearing uh, what's, what's going on in the world. Uh, the last couple of weeks, for example, we heard a lot about fires at the Mediterranean Sea. We are losing agricultural land. Um, we are also losing natural land. We are losing biodiversity. And as such, um, we are almost forced to, to reconvert land into natural land to not lose more biodiversity. So as a, as a result, we will not have a lot of agricultural land to feed the population. On top of that, we still have a growing population towards 10 billion people by 2050 when I was born in 1972, we were not even 4 billion. Now we're above 8 billion. So obviously, there's a mind change required, there's a change in behavior required, and we as GEA, we see, uh, we see the need to support our customers to uh, look into alternatives. So obviously, the mission here is to be more effective with our resources and to reduce the event, event, environmental impact uh, for our customers. And we have done that and we went on this mission uh, to provide a solution for the plant-based, cell-based, fermentation-based and insect-based business to change from what we see right now in our current world to a better world. And we are doing that based on five on all five values. There was a question given to me by you guys on diversity in, in our company. So diversity is uh, is a, is one of the values. I pointed two of them here out. Diversity is one of them. You will later on see a picture of my team, and you probably will see diversity reflected as well in, in my team. And the other big column here I would like to point out is of course the responsibility Gia is taking. Uh, we are 
taking care of the planet. We are safeguarding. We are safeguarding future generations, uh, and you would like to to enable the change from the current world to a better world. I'm trying to get to the next slide, but I cannot. Ah, no, no, it comes. Okay. So the mission we are on is we want to enable our customers to produce food more sustainably. And the mission is called the GEAR Mission 26 with a purpose that we are approaching a better world, a change from the current world as I just described. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I would like to point out the two square or framed uh, greenly framed uh, squares here. One is the, the new food. So that's our mission 26. Um, and uh, this mission is serving the purpose to change from the cold world to the better world. Our customers are producing uh, new food and we are enabling them with our solutions, our capabilities. New food by itself is a mission of sustainability. But beyond that, uh, we have a specific sustainability pillar to even our conventional business, the conventional food business to support our customers to, uh, to come to zero uh, carbon footprint, to come to zero water consumption. So um, GEAR takes this very serious, not only on the paper. Um, can you move on the next slide, please? Uh, GEAR's part is really the spirit of sustainability. This year, 2023, is a year of the sustainability for GEAR. And we are part of several sustainability indices, let's say uh, we, we won prices here as well. And uh, yeah, obviously we take it very serious. And while we are doing this, please move on to the next slide. We are also a forerunner, what we call uh, new food or alternatively produced proteins business. And these, what you see here are the six areas or categories we are working on from plant-based intermediates, plant-based beverages, plant-based food, insect proteins. And the last two ones are what I'm focusing on more in, in my uh, current role that is cell cultivation for meat products and so-called precision fermentation. Please move on to the next slide. Needless to say, we are a public company. We also have to grow. We also have to, to invest into the, right, uh, into the right areas. So obviously we have assessed, we know the global needs. We know the importance for the planet. Um, we know all the facts as you see them right now. So obviously there will be, there is already a strong uh, uh, demand on plant-based and we see a growing demand also on cell-based proteins. And this uh, will go on. Uh, just because of the fact that what I said, the, the world needs to change and we have to feed a very large population with fewer resources. Please move on to the next slide. GEA um, has a unique role here. GEA has a unique uh, portfolio of food processing capabilities for conventional, but also for new food. And therefore we have a role to play here to enable our customers to go into these new areas. So GEA is known to deliver full lines end to end from farm to fork, uh, the, whole, the whole ballpark let's say, but now in this area, we would rather say from cell to fork, but we are using and we are leveraging our existing capabilities. And you see here some, only some of them what we are using for cell-based proteins or for plant-based uh, proteins. And we are leveraging those technologies. We might here and there modify them for the specific new, new food needs. And we help our customers to make new food, not only sustainable, but also affordable and high in quality. So when our customers are coming to us, to, to the customers who are on this mission to, to our sustainability, there's also the request to, uh, to reach parity, parity in taste of the final product, parity in texture of the final product and parity in price, of course. And we are collaborating with our customers 
and we are using our application centers uh, to, to take the customers at the hand, to uh, work with them from lab scale, via pilot scale to industrial scale. Next slide, please. Now my role is R&D uh, and I really, um, there are several areas I'm, I'm covering, but I would like to, to focus on the left here, on the left red box here. That is a build up central and regional testing capabilities in growth region for our customers. So we are implementing new food test centers. Uh, the first one recently and uh, further will come. And this is what I will going, uh, what I'm going to talk about the next uh, 50 minutes or so. And the role is here to do with our customers proof of concept, to do prototyping with them up to scale up when they really can go into industrial scale. And we are helping them to do that with our capabilities. Next slide, please. Here you see the first, from an application uh, center point of view, the first milestone we have achieved in June, 2023. So it's just uh, whatever, eight weeks ago. Uh, we have launched our first GN New Food application and tech center in Germany. And we, you see a picture of the inauguration. And also I have done later on some presentation about it. We are getting very, very high feedback and good feedback on, on this innovation center. Um, our, our post uh, in the internet is getting a lot of traffic and we are getting a lot of requests how um, uh, our innovation or application center could be used for our customers' uh, benefit. Next slide, please. Can you see a little bit of picture um, how currently the technologies we have are looking? So this is a central and global hub to drive innovation in growth areas of what we call cellular agriculture. And we are using industrial standard technology. So this is not this is pilot scale, but it's not it's not industrial scale. It's pilot scale, but it's industrial standard for these applications. And we are in the center of it. You see further away in this picture so two bioreactors, a small, a smaller, and a bigger bioreactor. That's the core of every uh, fermentation line or cell cultivation line. And upstream on the left, you see capabilities from blending via UHT. And on the right side, you see, for example, uh, separation technologies, filtration technologies, and homogenization. And there are further ones, such as spray drying, for example, and more uh, will come. Next slide, please. This is only a slide to invite our customers. We have done a scan of our pilot plan. So this is a real picture of what you see here. So all the customers who are interested can, can come to me, approach me. I'm happy to walk with them through our virtual tour so they could see, have a better impression on what we have. And then we can discuss in detail uh, how the capabilities can be used for the customer's benefit. Next slide, please. So what do we have? Um, we have, we are not only operating an application center, we are designing application centers. We are designing for lines, obviously. So we really build first what we are, what we are operating. Uh, correspondingly, we have a highly skilled cross-functional team with competence and experience in designing and operating new food lines across the globe, starting with the one I just mentioned, but we will further expand into the regions on the globe. We have also lab capabilities for micro uh, incubation as well as for mammal or fish cell cultivation. So we have two different labs separate from each other to replicate the steps our customers have been doing uh, to do that with them together. And then we transfer the, uh, the cultures to our bioreactors. Um, and then we move with that, we move it to the pilot scale and we make the trials together with our customers. Our units, so the different units we have are fully automated, but also can be operated in manual modes. As I said, in the, the core, the masterpiece are the bioreactors slash fermenters, and we have between 50 and 2,000 
500 years in capacity. We have upstream processing uh, from ingredients, dosing up to the cultivation, and the downstream pro processing is accordingly up to, for example, a protein, a protein powder, for example. Application focus could be traditional fermentation, brewing, biotech and bioprocessing, then more, more towards precision fermentation and cell cultivation, um, alternative proteins, uh, plant-based proteins and food ingredients. And from an manufacturing standpoint, engineering standpoint, we are designing, planning, integrating, automating uh, projects for our customers. We do the project management, we do construction management, and we have a global representation in the, the different region, in regions, and we have the experience specifically in food processing, but also in, in pharma um, applications. Next slide, please. Here you can see a little bit better what we actually have right now, uh, a, a formula mixer, a UHT system to sterilize the media, uh, fermenter, fermenter to do pre-cultivation and the main, main cultivation and the big fermenter. And then we can homogenize our, um, our uh, strains to, for example, to get the protein out, we can separate and sell fragments from solutions. We can clarify the solution. We can do filtration, ultra nano and biofiltration towards a high protein concentrate. And then we can do spray drawing, for example, to do, um, to get it, to come to a final uh, protein powder. Um, so we do here proof of concept with our customers. We have proprietary design uh, in different equi uh, equipment and technologies. And uh, we are providing to our customers a lot of testing capabilities as well to, to really see, uh, analyze the products, what was they've produced with us. Next slide, please. A little bit more details on the applications, what we call new food um, or cellular agriculture, I should rather say. So one is the precision fermentation. Uh, so we are fermenting with uh, bacteria, yeast or fungus uh, with the intention to produce specific proteins, enzymes, also plant-based products and other ingredients on the very strong focus though is proteins. Uh, so we have customers that can, uh, that have strains who can produce the objective is the target. So we would like to, uh, to, um, to have proliferation. We would like to grow these cells to different cells into muscle or fat cells, and then produce either hybrid unstructured products, plant-based cell-based products, or later on even structured meat-based products. Next slide, please. Here a little bit more in detail. On the left, you see uh, a fermentation with microorganisms. So what normally is being done in, in precision fermentation is that we are using experts, microorganism experts. So they would be uh, modified um, via a vector to produce a certain specific protein. And we would then grow this protein, we would uh, trigger the, sorry, we would grow the, the organism, we would trigger the production of the protein. And uh, after a certain level, we would then uh, take, the, the, take the organism out and uh, homogenize them, get the protein out, clarify it, uh, filtrate um, the protein towards high concentration and at the end spray dry. And we can get dairy proteins out of that, uh, as I said before, whey proteins or casein, lactoferins and so on, enzymes, functional proteins. So it's a very, very uh, broad application and, and these different ingredients that could be used in, in multiple application um, uh, in the food business in cheeses and dairy mixes and desserts and yogurts and so on. Um, on the cell cultivation 
side I mentioned already, we are talking about uh, mammal cells to be differentiated into muscle and fat cells. So these are the two big components, two main components. And the ultimate objective is minimum is an unstructured product, uh, a hyper product, a plant-based, cell-based, uh, but there are even long-term uh, objectives of our customers to do a structured uh, product like a steak consisting of fat, um, tissue, and, and uh, muscle tissue. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. There's more to come. So I talk about um, our first uh, application center in Europe, but we have recently moved on to uh, towards a new application center in the US, North America. So um, <clears throat> it says here the roadmap is in place for North America, Middle East, and APEC, but North America is already further. So that is the next one to be launched next year. Besides that, he has further investing into new technology development projects. So there are potentially some ga gaps um, towards a structured meat product and GIA is heavily investing into those. So we are working with partners uh, to identify the right solutions towards new food applications. And while doing that, we will be able to deliver the full scope of new food applications end to end. Next slide, please. And here's what the American center will look like. So the scope is very similar to what I've shown you before. The bioreactor, they're a little bit more, actually there are more bioreactors uh, planned for the US application center. Uh, the only difference is they don't have yet the big bioreactor above thousand liters in the portfolio. Everything else is pretty much similar. Also the application focus and our capabilities. The plant or the application center will be located in Janesville. In uh, it's two week, two hours from from Chicago. Chicago being an international city, accessible from everywhere, and uh, also good food culture around. So it's the perfect uh, spot also for us to serve our customers in North America very well. Next slide, please. Um, the American and the German uh, application centers are the first unique full application centers reflecting the entire applications in new food, but they are embedded into a testing center landscape from GIA. GIA has a lot of testing centers around the globe, but these are more or less reflecting individual technologies rather than an entire application. And our customers are on a daily basis approaching us with new challenges, with new ideas, with new needs. And we are very flexible. We are collaborating with all these uh, testing centers. And if we have a new need of new technologies, we will get them on board. We will integrate them into our application centers to deliver to the customer needs. So we are, uh, a colleague of mine always is saying our, our application center is never complete, is never finished because we are always in, in movement. We are reacting to the needs and thanks to the massive portfolio GEA has from farm and cell to fork, we are able to do so. And with that, I think I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, the last slide, the next slide should be just my contact data. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy. I'm trying to answer those. Um, uh, and, but also later on, uh, feel free to contact me and I will pick up the phone or answer your email. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Excellent talk. A um, couple questions that leap to mind. Uh, for, first of all, we, we don't have any questions in the q and I, I have a couple. And by all means, please do capture the information that is shown on the screen so that you can uh, reach back out to the GIA team. Um, I, I'm curious to know a little bit about your human machine interfaces on the equipment that you have a little bit more control and automation on. Uh, is there any um, information you'd like to share about your HMIs? Every equipment is equipped with HMIs. Uh, obviously, they independently operate and it's a 
Okay, it's a good question. It's it is not a small scale industrial line. It's a fully flexible R and D line, so we can combine the equipment with with each other with all the mechanical interfaces. We are also using um, aseptic tanks as a immediate storage, so we we can transfer product aseptically from one to the next and then bring it to the next equipment. So we have foreseen all the interfaces to mechanically uh, combine them, but they all of them are. You can automate them independently. You have an HMI on, on each system. Uh, but if it comes to later on to scale up, we are flexible, whatever system, you know, from an automation standpoint, you would prefer you would prefer. So we are working with different suppliers, obviously, on, on that side. Okay. All right. So it sounds to me like you're you're reasonably um agnostic when it comes to uh, HMI manufacturers and service providers. I am personally not what Gear as company is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I'm curious to know if there is a workforce development element uh, to your ATCs, or, or uh, you know, how you help to um, expand knowledge and capabilities to the new generation. Within the company, you mean, or out of the company? Uh, I guess out of the company for folks that might need the training on the equipment that you're um, that you're providing. Yeah, so let's let's split the question then. Um, so whoever our customers are, we are in full control of operating our our um, ATC, obviously. But at some point, it comes to that they would like to have individual units, or they they even want to go to their own pilot plant or even go to industrial lines. So we, we provide trainings on our equipment as well for all the customers who are interested to, uh, to do so. We also involve what we call our COCs, our center of competences. So all our, all our equipment might come from different gear entities and they have their own experts and they come to our site to A, teach us, <laughs> but also to teach our customers if they need this training. And uh, with the expansion to other regions, I mentioned the US, also people from the US will come to our side right now to learn what we have right now to later on be able to, to bring that know-how to their regional uh, testing center. Okay, with that, I uh, thank you, Elias, and we will move on. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> we have our next speaker ready. Colby Adol from Evonik. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, thanks for listening to this talk and thank you to the ABPDU organizers for setting this up. It's super important in this space to find ways to scale up fermentation processes in an age where we just don't have enough capacity for one reason or another, so thanks. I'll be talking about two of our fermentation sites that are during this presentation. The one pictured is one of them. This is our Fermos site in Slovakia. And I'll also talk about our Tipica new site in Lafayette, Indiana. So Evonik as a whole is a large specialty chemical company. Um, we're over 33,000 employees. We're active in over 100 companies, uh, over 100 countries. And we break that down into four different operating divisions, um, covering a wide range of chemical needs, specialty additives, performance materials, smart materials. We don't make any end consumer products, but you do experience the value of those products with Evonik's ingredients. What we'll focus on here is nutrition and care. So this is our life sciences division. Um, this has pharmaceutical manufacturing, medical devices, nutraceuticals, animal nutrition and care solutions. Um, and with fermentation or synthetic biology that can cover a whole host of those. So that fits nicely in our healthcare division. And looking at nutrition and care a little bit closely. So I mentioned we are a B2B company. We like to see that as a B4B because we're not just a toller. We like to be a strategic partner in the value that we bring to the companies that we work with. We provide customer centric system solutions um, for complex challenges. So we are trying to keep our ear to the ground and what challenges um, the, our customers are facing and then sculpt our values and our, our goals around that. Sustainability drives us. So we look for opportunities to be sustainable in everything that we do, whether that's in um, modifying our plants to be 
more environmentally friendly or choosing um, programs to engage with that provide sustain sustainable solutions as synthetic biology does. And collaboration defines us. Um, so we have a rich history of collaborating with different types of companies. One is um, we made the lipids in the COVID vaccine. So we had a public partnership with BioNTech um, and we like to take that forward. We have another one with Unilever. And so again, we don't just provide tolling services. Um, we provide all around strategic support. And healthcare, this slide um, is just here to show that we have a lot at our hands with, with healthcare. So over 50 specialized core competencies, 10 production sites, over a thousand customers. Um, we don't like to work in silos, even though we're a very large company. And so this slide is here to kind of drive that home that we have a lot of expertise that we can pull from. Jumping into fermentation, Specifically, we have over 30 years of experience across pharma, advanced food ingredients, and biomaterials, um, a worldwide presence, which we'll get into, and over 4,000 cubic meters of fermentation capacity available to customers via CDMO. So here is a map of our different sites. Um, so in the US, um, Brazil, China, and around Europe, um, these are different development sites um, and production facility sites. And as I mentioned, I'll focus on the Tipica new site, which is in Lafayette, Indiana, and then also our Firma site in Slovakia. Um, but because of that, because of this rich global footprint that we have, we can make use of the different development opportunities or the different scale up opportunities at a lot of these different sites. One of our um, one of the values that we bring to customers is our Ivanic Biotech Hub. So this is an entity that exists outside of our specifically fermentation manufacturing or development purposes. Um, we have 180 people who cover different R&D competencies. So if a customer is really early, very early in their stage and they need strain development or process development, we would likely start with the support of the, bio, of the um, biotech hub. So with the biotech hub, we have a few different ways of providing value um, systems in biotechnology, uh, process biotechnology, lab operations, and then of course, all the while having really good program and project management to drive those to production and, and customers for scale up and commercialization. And we like to take a holistic process development approach. So with the Biohub, if we um, needed, you know, strain development, we have our omics technologies um, to help customers with that. If cu customers come with a strain, but they need process development support, we have um, various scales available up to five cubic meters for pilot runs. And then our commercial upstream equipment ranges from 50 cubic meters to 250 cubic meters, all the while having very strong analytical capabilities within Ivonic to help support the process at each stage. And here are some examples um, of our fermentation platforms. So we have, you know, the standard feedstocks, glucose, sucrose, et cetera. Um, a few upstream examples, fed batch, high cell density processing we can do um, downstream processing, a lot of the standard biomass separation, cell disruption, continuous extraction. This isn't an exhaustive list. Um, so if you see something that you know you would need and it's not here, that would be a great conversation to have. So here's a view of our equipment, just a, a small overview for the different stages of a process. So at lab scale, um, we have really small equipment all the way up to 500 milliliters, um, bioelectors, shake flask, and then bench top for process development, we'll move into the two liter vessels um, and then up to the five cubic meter for a little bit larger pilot scaling. And then of course, um, up to 250 for commercial tech transfer and scale up. So what would it look like if we were to work together? Um, we'd start with the project transfer. So um, the companies that we'll, we'll work with will send us a tech package. 
um, strain information, we'll use that to do lab familiarization. So this is us running the chemistry in our hands and making sure that it does for us what you anticipate and what you've seen in your labs and from your CROs. Um, we would be developing analytical methods, um, having a, um, you know, targets, identifying um, key KPIs, CQAs that are important for the process. And then moving into industrialization, so making sure that what we learned in familiarization is implemented um, accurately into the, the process that we um, create for upscaling and then trying that out on the pilot scale and eventually commercial manufacturing. And I think everyone's goal is um, ramp up followed by routine production. So that's ours as well. So getting into our specific sites, our Firma site I mentioned is in Slovakia. Um, this is historically an amino acid site, but now we're product class agnostic. So we work with a wide range of um, different products with, for customers. And again, this isn't exhaustive, um, but just some examples of things that we've worked on. Organism overview, again, same line here, but um, a few of, of the more popular ones and then you know, all four of the main um, organism classes. A quick view at our pilot scale equipment at Fermas. So we have two five cubic meter fermentation vessels um, and two multi-purpose pilot downstream processing vessels. And these are really nice. They're modular. Uh, one limit we have is just everything has to be BSL-1, which tends to not be an issue. Um, and then a few pictures to go along with those equipment. So we have uh, ultra filtration units, nano filtration units, just stack centrifuge, um, a few a few standard options here. And then at Fermos, we have 23 50 cubic meter fermentation vessels available for CDMO work. Um, this is a 24 seven op um, operated manufacturing plant with C train infrastructure included. Um, continuous and in situ media sterilization. And then Fermos has the rich lab scale equipment to um, help make this transition really one to one. We go from development to pilot to commercial. A few of the commercial downstream processing equipment at Fermos. Um, so, again, MFUF evaporation, a lot to mimic. Um, the pilot downstream equipment to make sure that, again, we have proper scale up and are matching the equipment and processes as well. And then our quality control. So here are um, a few uh, standard analyses that we do. Um, we support the end processing, product release, um, and then process monitoring. Also, we have GMP implementation ongoing. We do use GMP systems, though, and we can get into details about what that means if, if we were to work together. But we do have um, a very well-populated QC lab on site. Um, a quick look at Fermos's certification. So ISO 9001, um, kosher and halal for food, food FSSC, um, and then GMP management systems. So all in all, Fermos is a nice complete package. Um, you can bring your process here for strain development, scale up, pilot, and commercial all in one. Um, it's a really good site for getting started. You can start here and then move to our larger site um, for, for larger volumes, which would be our typical new site. So Typica New Labs is located in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, so if you're familiar with Purdue University, that's where I went, boiler up for any boilermakers out there. It's in the background here. The Wabash River is here. And then this entire area is surrounded by communities. And we like to point this out because Avonik is very careful again about what we put into the environment. Hopefully nothing, but whatever we do put in terms of vapors, we have an on-site regenerative thermal oxidizer to make sure all of our chemical process vapors are clean before they hit the air. And we abide by strict monitoring and regulations with the Wabash River to make sure we keep that safe as well. On-site, um, this is historically an Eli Lilly site. So pharma base, we have a lot of small molecule uh, uh, reactor buildings on site. We also have R&D, quality control, QA, and then in the front here, we have our fermentation assets. 
where we have over 65 years of experience there um, and over 2,500 cubic meter fermenter volume. So large molecule manufacturing, this is a nice little uh, perspective of how big some of our, our assets are at the site. But again, we have a long history at the site of fermentation production, um, really good culture rates, uh, equipment, over 20 industrial scale fermenters with capacities from 60 to 250 and I have those details on the next slide specifically. Um, and then a really experienced production team. You know, we, um, we're not isolated from the, the small molecule side. We still have a rich uh, technical support team, a lot of engineers to cover the different bases needed for product implementation. So um, fermentation, even though we are an API site mostly, still gets a lot of, of sources and resources it needs to be successful. So we have three equipment venues, um, T2s, T2As, and T2Cs. The T2As are here just to show you what we have, but these are currently dedicated equipment, but the two T2s and the T2C venues are available for customer manufacturing. So we have 12 of the 68.5 cu uh, cubic meter vessels. Those are gonna be around 60 cubic meters working volume and then 245 cubic meter um, two T2C vessels with about 220, 210 working volume. So lots of space there. So with that, I'll take any questions um, and thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Colby. This is fantastic. <clears throat> um, curious to know a little bit more about your uh, the, the, the front end that you had referenced in terms of R&D and work uh, that, uh, that you would do in the omics realm and so on to understand, uh, help, your, help your partners understand some of the side reactions and whatnot in, in metabolic space. Uh, are you actively working with outside groups such as biofoundries and so on uh, for, for uh, metabolic engineering? Um, I'm not super sure on that, James, where that information comes from, um, but, I think our I think it would be a mix of both, but I would have to follow up. Sure. Okay, and with regard to time, I think we are basically at time. So perhaps I will uh, uh, just uh, let folks reach out to Kobe to um, to ask any additional questions. And and thank you so much. Thanks, James. So next we have Kevin Fox from Manus Bio. Great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present here. Uh, I'm Kevin Fox. I'm the head of the biomanufacturing program at Manus, and I'm excited to let everyone know what Manus is up to and what we're currently offering. So first of all, I'll just give a little bit of a background on Manus, just in case people don't know who we are. Um, so Manus uh, is a, a, a little bit over a 10 year old company. Uh, we are a vertically integrated synthetic biology, commercially successful um, company. Uh, we have four commercialized products that we have developed all the way from the bench through commercial manufacturing. Um, in 2022, we shipped over 25 metric tons across 40 different countries to over 70 different customers. And because we own and operate our own manufacturing, we continue to invest into that capacity and it brought over 250 metric tons of capacity online over the past couple of years. Um, because we're a fully a fully vertical company, we also have a robust R&D pipeline with over 20 different products in that pipeline across the different verticals shown on the right here. Uh, our current products are in the food and beverage space. So I wanted to give just a quick case study um, to kind of highlight the vertical integration of Manus and one of our commercialized products. So this uh, product is a citrus oil that we... Uh, developed in collaboration with Givadon, the flavor and fragrance company based out of Europe. Uh, to give the sustainability and the reason why uh, for this product, uh, on the left you can see that agricultural production of one kilo of this oil takes um, over a year and over 400,000 kilos of fruit, whereas obviously with, with um, with cellular production we can produce that much quicker and from only a few kilograms of sugar. 
uh, to highlight some of our upstream capabilities that we utilized to develop this product. Um, we utilized bioprospecting to look at different types of um, enzymes from different sources, as well as utilized enzyme engineering to increase the activity and the specificity of these different these different enzymes. So these come from things like grape, the stevia plant, and happy tree, all coming from different parts of the world. We then utilized our metabolic engineering and systems biology capabilities to optimize these cell factories and improved throughput over 200 times. And then the highlight of this talk is talking about our capabilities to scale up and manufacture this product. So we scaled this to large scale fermentation um, and currently produce this at our, our fully owned and operated facility uh, located within the US that I'll talk about in a bit. And it's currently sold under by Givadon um, through the bionucatone uh, as as uh, bionucatone. So the capability that I really want to highlight here uh, that people on this call are interested in is our capability across different scales to bring different um, bioprocesses to scale and also develop understanding across scale. Um, this slide is just meant to really show that understanding at one specific scale is not enough. There needs to be understanding across different scales for these different types of activities. Um, things, things like seed train development, process optimization, downstream process development really needs to be thought about early on and then continue to be developed across these different scales. And just as a testament to Manis's capability in this, on the top left, you can see the different um, tighter, the different performances of our of two of our products across different scales um, and how they are re we reproduce the performance across these different scales. So one of the key capabilities of Manus is our ability to scale and, uh, and um, produce at large volumes. So the reason for this is our large scale biomanufacturing facility that is located in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, this formula, formerly was the NutraSuite facility that produced all of the aspartame for Diet Coke in the North American market. Uh, we acquired the facility in 2018 and since then have been both bringing back online fermentation vessels as well as other capabilities and continue to invest in the facility and operate it 24-7 to produce our own products. So just to give a background on this facility itself, this is one of the largest biomanufacturing facilities in the Americas, and it's a fully integrated facility, meaning it has all the process capabilities needed in terms of utilities, downstream pro processing, um, waste treatment, fermentation that are needed for a full process. The facility itself, itself has 1.3 million liters of capacity and is on a 44-acre footprint. Some of the different scales. So we have a small scale process development lab um, with a bio amber unit, as well as some benchtop bioreactors. Um, the key thing I would like to highlight at, on this on this call is our pilot facility. Uh, so this is a large pilot facility with nine 300 liter reactors and a 3800 liter reactor. Uh, enables a lot of sample production as well as process uh, process data gathering. And then we have large scale biomanufacturing. So our two 40,000 liter reactors are what we operate 24 seven currently for our large scale production. Two 600,000 liter reactors are currently installed and were utilized by NutraSuite. We don't currently have a product that makes sense for those. So those have remained idle. Um, we're currently looking for partners to work in co-investing and bring that capacity online. We have long-term cap capacity expansion um, strategies where we're bringing those online in the future for our own products. However, we're always interested in conversations around how to strategically bring those on quicker. And the same is the case for our five 130K reactors. Um, those are not currently installed. We purchased those elsewhere, but we currently have um, engineering plans as well as are in discussions with groups on how to on integrating those into our facility and utilizing them for production in Augusta. So I'm gonna show a quick video that'll give a little bit of a tour of the facility. Hopefully this works. I'm not sure if the sound will come through, um, but that's okay if it doesn't.
So as I mentioned, we are a, we are a product company as well as a services company. So we saw an opportunity um, after having developed our own production um, pipelines and um, own processes where there was a need, especially with US-based per, uh, fermentation capacity. Um, and so we saw three big value adds for the Manus offering in this. It's our extensive capabilities and capacity as what I just showed on the past couple of slides. The experienced team that we have that has scaled multiple products for Manus, as well as had experience previously through other, uh, through working at NutraSuite previously or elsewhere. And then finally is our strategic location uh, located in Augusta, Georgia, which is easily accessible. The current offering that we have that is available right now uh, to work with partners on is our pilot plant. And here is some of the capabilities of the pilot plant itself. Um, I mentioned the different fermentation capacities, but I'll just uh, repeat again the nine 300 liters that we have available um, and that we currently use for our own process development, but also are working with partners on developing processes utilizing, as well as the 3.8K. We have experience across multiple different organisms, as well as process conditions. And also we have a wide array of different DSP capabilities because we've had to develop our own DSP um, through this facility as well at the bench and the pilot scale, generally including centrifugation, filtration, drying, evaporation, chromatography, crystallization, and distillation. We also have extensive analytics capabilities uh, with all of these shown on the right. And finally, the facility itself is FDA kosher and halal certified. So how working with us generally looks like, uh, it looks very similar to uh, other models where we work together um, to share key information and prepare a proposal document to uh, decide exactly how we can meet the needs of the partner. Um, because we're a fairly small uh, or a fairly small and nimble company, we're able to bring people in quickly and we're able to do a lot of different things uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, we can schedule and access capacity very quickly. And also um, there's an there's a opportunity to visit our Augusta site before signing an agreement during the planning phase, as well as during the actual execution of the project. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the time and I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. Okay, so, uh... One uh, quick question for uh, Manus uh, from from one of the attendees: uh, Do you, uh, the, the, does uh, any of your 40, uh, 130, or six hundred uh, kiloliter bioreactors have aeration capability? Yeah, so they're all aerobic. Um, so the 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 forty and one thirty k's are stirred tank, and the six hundred k is currently an airlift. Excellent. I noticed that you uh, make mention of uh, continuous uh, fermentation as a mode. Can you describe that just a little bit? So it's kind of just basically because of how the pilot plant itself is piped, where we can we can make it so that it operates in a continuous mode. Um, it, it's really a case on case by case basis in terms of exactly what we can operate. Um, but because of how it is set up, we we can be quite um, novel with that. Okay. Is there any restriction on uh, types of strains you accept? Gram negative, positive, fun, fungal, spore forming, et cetera? Um, I believe our only limit would be BSL-1. Um, and other than that, I believe we're fairly open to um, many different types of strains. As also, also, we have a lot of experience with different strains as well. Okay. And yes, we we do operate that batch. Okay, excellent. Very good. Okay, and so I think with that, we can come to a close. I hope everybody got uh, uh, Kevin's contact information, and um, and thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks to ABPDU for this opportunity to present here. Uh, my name is Smita Shankar. I'm speaking on behalf of Fermic, which, as many of you are probably familiar, is a contract biomanufacturing facility primarily based uh, in Mexico City. <clears throat> so uh, to start with a little bit in term, by means of introduction, 
Um, Firmic was founded uh, in 1968. It's a family-run company run by the Falzoni family. So we've been producing fermentation-based products now for over 55 years. I have a lot of operational experience running different types of products, and I will speak to that over the next few slides. Um, the company originally started as a pharma API manufacturer. Um, and over the years, um, over the last few decades, have evolved the business model to a multi-purpose biomanufacturing facility. Um, we have a few different uh, assets. Uh, of course, the main plant based in Mexico City, we have a commercial capacity there of 2.3 million liters. Uh, it's a 24-7 um, operational uh, bustling plant uh, in the heart of Mexico City. Um, we also have 1.7 million liters of commercial capacity uh, at a site in Hannibal, Missouri, uh, which is not a currently operational plant, but has been operational in the recent past. Um, in addition, we have recently acquired a, a spray drying site, the Dry Services, which has a drying capacity of 2,000 metric tons per year, uh, which is uh, within a few hours of Mexico City. So primarily, these are the main, um, uh, main locations. Uh, wanted to take some time to talk a little bit about the leadership team that oversees more of the contract manufacturing side. Uh, as I mentioned, we did start as an API manufacturer, and we still do produce our own products, API products. Uh, and I, I won't be speaking to that part. And there is a leadership team serving that as well. Uh, but the primary primary people involved with the working with customers for contract biomanufacturing um, are Alessandro, myself, and Charles, who's also uh, participating um, in the event today. Um, Many of you may be familiar with Alessandro. He's been running this facility for um, almost 30 years, more than 30 years now, um, has seen a variety of products come through at different scales uh, and commercialized actually, and taken several products to market across uh, several industries, food, enzymes, uh, chemicals, uh, agriculture, um, you name it. And so uh, he's a, a uh, walking encyclopedia of different types of processes. Um, I was on a call last week with a, an industry veteran who referred to bi uh, Fermic as the backbone of the biotech industry. I thought that was a good line, so I, I figured I would throw that in here. Uh, came from someone else, not from us, so I, I take that as a huge compliment. Um, uh, myself, uh, I have only been at Fermic for a few months now, less than a year. I've been familiar with the site for a long time and a long-standing relationship with uh, with the uh, with the plant. Um, prior to Fermic, I worked at a company called Impossible Foods, and I led our strain fermentation, process development, and scale up commercialization of uh, our proprietary ingredient team. And so I have uh, been on the customer side of things and taken a process to large scale um, and really enjoy now being um, on the other side, uh, helping other people scale the value of death, the, as people have referred to. Um, and then Charles uh, comes with tremendous experience also before Fermic has worked uh, taking several products again to commercialization uh, with experience from Virinium um, uh, and then uh, BP, Zymergen, several companies. So between the three of us, we have seen um, several products that have um, gone through and successfully emerged on the other side of the Valley of Death and commercialized. Um, in terms of the services, we are a full service contract manufacturing organization. Um, several people in, uh, in the sessions today have already talked about the different steps. So, uh, but just to kind of refresh how we work, um, we start, uh, we typically onboard customers uh, at the pilot stage. So we do a tech transfer. Um, the customers come to us with their process. Uh, the, the strain process product comes from the customer. We only take the process in. We do not offer R&D services. Um, however, what we do offer is scale-up services, which is an understanding of how large-scale uh, operations and equipment work. Um, and we take the customer processes and we uh, guide them on how to best take that to the large scale. Um, and we have done this now for um, several types of molecules. Of course, we've done proteins, enzymes, small molecules, different types of processes. 
Uh, many types of organisms, bacteria, yeasts, filamentous fungi. So experience across different organisms and different types of products. Um, and we've also experienced working with different clients, uh, that is companies of different sizes. So there are startups, very early stage startups through to large companies with very established processes. So we have the sort of uh, ability to work across the board with uh, different capabilities. We do um, expect the uh, customers to come in with some sort of proof of principle process having been tested at some reasonable scale and a sense for the product specifications. So they know what they need to make, what specification they need to hit um, for their product to be sold. Um, eventually, the goal is to take the processes through to commercial scale. We like to work with the customers and taking them to uh, the next level and uh, helping them commercialize. Um, so, of course, we are a large scale uh, manufacturing production um, facility, and so we have all the systems that are associated with uh, large scale production. We have uh, quality quality systems, we have regulatory team and support. Our quality and regulatory teams are again, uh, familiar with working across different um, industries, whether it's food or pharma or ag or enzyme. So they have the familiarity of what it takes to work across uh, uh, different industries. Um, and then we provide end-to-end -end logistics, uh, of course, uh, as, as a part of the services. So these are sort of the main steps that we participate uh, participate in. We like to think of it as more of a partnership model because uh, and I think several people have touched upon it uh, in talks today that with bioproducts, it's rarely a case of someone coming with a sheet of paper and telling us what they need, need done. And so it becomes a collaborative partnership approach where um, the customers come with the process or the product, and then we have the facilities, we have the operational equipment ex experience, we will work together with them uh, to take the pro process to large scale. Again, as I mentioned before, um, examples of types of industries we serve, um, we have experience with food, um, we have uh, experience with enzymes, um, chemicals, um, as well as biologics. Um, so, okay, so in terms of uh, commercial fermentation capacity, just a little bit about that. All of our fermenters are pharma grade stainless steel. They're stir tank bioreactors capable of very high oxygen transfer. They're suitable for aerobic processes. Uh, I saw a lot of questions today about picia and methanol. So we do have the ability to um, um, feed methanol into our processes and, uh, and we have experience running picia as well. Um, our fermenters are of different sizes depending on the capacity needs and uh, the readiness of the process. We have 20,000, 50,000, 70,000, 90,000, and 190,000 liter fermenters um, in Mexico City. <clears throat> Additionally, as I had mentioned earlier, we do have a plant in Hannibal, Missouri, which has 160,000 liter um, fermenters as well. And then as, uh, as we have all been hearing uh, again a lot today about uh, downstream, like really what distinguishes different processes is uh, how the product is uh, extracted from the fermentation broth or separated from the fermentation broth. Um, I have listed only some equipment here, uh, but we have uh, pretty much every downstream, downstream equipment that you could uh, imagine. Uh, that's used in fermentation based processes. Um, so the usual suspects, you know, centrifugation, microfiltration, ultrafiltration. Uh, we also do solvent extraction distillation. So we have uh, capabilities for that as well. Chromatography, pasteurization, um, RO. Um, we also do spray drying um, and we are currently in the process of expanding our spray drying capabilities as well. So a lot of familiarity with uh, standard processes um, used across uh, proteins, small molecules for different industry. Um, I wanted to end with telling a little about the pilot plant because that's really where a lot of the new customers are onboarded when they um, come to Fermic. And so we have uh, three fermenters of thousand liter size, 
and one 5,000 liter fermenter. Um, and so this is where we are typically um, bringing on customers who have usually tested their process at something uh, in the order of between a hundred and a few hundred liters scale. Um, we have uh, most of the downstream processing equipment um, at the pilot scale as well. I have listed some of these here. You can take a look. I don't need to read through every one of them, but uh, your basic centrifugation, microvaloration, UF, again, solvent extraction, spray drying, all types of equipment. And the goal here for us is to run the process at pilot and be able to match as closely as possible to the large scale and be able to tell our customers how best to take the process to uh, large scale and run it um, at the commercial scale that is necessary. Um, so with that, I think um, that was uh, my last slide, um, leaving you here with the contact information. As I said, Charles is also um, uh, present today here um, it, at the seminar and at the webinar. And then I have his e email address as well as mine. Um, if anyone has any questions, happy to answer them now, um, or please feel free to reach out uh, after uh, and we'll be happy to uh, uh, address anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Smita. Uh, so we do have a little bit of time for a, a couple of questions. We don't see any questions specifically in the Q and A uh, panel, but uh, let me let me just ask one or two. Um, so I remember I, I recall you saying that um, as long as the prospective partner has uh, some reasonable scale, uh, is there is there a, a sense of what that range of reasonableness is is for Fermic? I, uh, uh, the short answer is uh, no, I think it depends. Uh, it, it, they need to have tested it at uh, ferment at some level of fermentation. Well, these days people are able to run small scale fermenters really reliably and get good amount of data, right? So if you are run like, uh, if you have considerable data just even from lab scale, but you have reliable information from that, um, then we are still open to that. Uh, I think if uh, there are some people who approach us with just having done shake flask, not having done uh, ferment fermentations, uh, that becomes a little bit of a problem because we don't do process development. Um, and even if it's a small scale process, but there has been some degree of downstream development, uh, that's important for us because that's the other thing. If you have only done fermentation and no sense of downstream, we don't develop the process for, uh, for the customers um, but if there is any sense for here's the specification, here's the basic downstream process outline, and here's my fermentation process, then we are always uh, engaging customers in the conversation. Uh, no one gets turned away just because they haven't run it at a few hundred liters. Got it. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and uh, a question that that came up earlier uh, and uh, is being uh, asked again is the types of um, of strains and types of organisms that you that you are typically running yeah so we uh, we pretty much run um, most organisms the only one we currently don't uh, run uh, is uh, E. coli off the BSL-1 uh, organisms, right? Like, so uh, we don't typically run E. coli in the plant. We have uh, reasons for that, but we are always keeping an open mind to seeing as we grow and evolve uh, what changes. Okay. Uh, Stephen asks um, uh, uh, maybe a, a provocative question. What has been the surprisingly important part of uh, Fermic's long-term success? I think... Uh, Honestly, I think it's sort of the relationships and partnerships that uh, Fermic has built over the decades with a lot of the people we have worked with. Uh, and as you know, as both Charles and I are people who were at one point <laughs> customers of Fermic who then uh, joined uh, Fermic, I think that's, that's a telling sign of how we work. Uh, and so I think it's a question of really spending the time and effort, uh, being very um, honest and uh, true about how hard these processes are. So we have to acknowledge they are hard and say, we will try to do them. Uh, so just trying to say, you know, we're, we're realistic about our projections, but with the, but then we work hard and go uh, try to get them. So I, I would say that um, that's sort of the culture that Alessandro has built um, in the company. And I think that's been uh, very important for the success of the company. Excellent. We are, um...
We are uh, out of time, and I would definitely please uh, uh, ask you to reach out to Smita for additional questions and uh, uh, let us move on. And thank you again so much, Smita and, and Charles. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Subin. Um, I'm a senior scientist working with the uh, Western Center. We are based in Sydney, Nova Scotia in Eastern Canada. Um, so good to uh, be able to reach out to you all. Um, and thank you to APVDU to organize this uh, webinar. Um, so the Version Center was founded by the Cambridge University um, in 2012, uh, and we became an independent not-for-profit uh, organization still within the Cambridge University campus uh, in 2019. Uh, we completed the uh, build of a a uh, thousand liter, one meter cube by manufacturing pilot facility on site in 2021, and are in the process of now building a 10,000 liter facility uh, in in in, uh, in the uh, CBRM, uh, not on the same site. Um, so that's a little bit of background on our center. Um, we are a, a small team of around four, 40 people. And we are working with a, a number of different clients in the space. Uh, we are a shared use facility. Uh, so we have uh, some of our clients uh, with their staff on site where they are renting the facility to be able to do product and process development on site. Um, on. Uh, we engage with our clients in uh, a variety of different formats. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are a shared use facility. Um, uh, so our clients are, we help the, our clients to be able to hire their own staff on site or bring their folks on site to be able to uh, engage uh, and develop processes on site. We, uh, we also engage as a technology deployment or a service provider model where we, you know, uh, 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 organize a service segment and approach the clients that way. Uh, we have uh, scientists who are able to, uh, you know, uh, provide inputs and be assisting the clients with uh, their process development. So we we do have a collaborative engagement model uh, as well. Uh, there are a number of instances where clients have moved from uh, countries like the US uh, to our site uh, with the help of ecosystem partners like Invest Nova Scotia, and sustainable SDTC, uh, sustainable development and uh, sustainable development technology Canada, uh, through which uh, they are able to uh, secure funding and non dilutive grants to be able to um, uh, do product and process development. Um, so we we engage with clients on a variety of uh, technology readiness levels. Uh, so early stage companies. We work with them uh, to be able to apply for academic grants and uh, uh, non-dilutive funding. Uh, we we have a pilot facility to be able to scale up your uh, technology, um, uh, and and eventually we want to be in the space to be able to uh, you know uh, for our clients to be able to do commercialization. Um, so we have a, a biosafety level one lab on site, a BSL two lab as well, with the fully equipped analytical suit. We have uh, instrumentation, as uh, mentioned previously, like uh, uh, LCUV, uh, FDAR, a typical analytical uh, instrumentation that is needed for a wide range of product characterization, both on the bio side as well as the material characterization. Um, uh, for example, for polymer characterization. Um, UTM, uh, universal testing machines and things like that. We also have a biomarine extraction facility which can do non-sterile fermentation up to a 5,000 liter scale along with the downstream processing that is needed um, like this stack and um, uh, decanter centrifuges, flow through centrifuges. We also have a plant growth lab which uh, can be used for uh, plant trials in a controlled environment. Uh, we also have on site the pilot greenhouse uh, for again doing um, agriculture product testing. Uh, so we have a number of different teams uh, at the version center who are 
who work very closely with each other to be able to uh, provide a wide range of services to our clients. Um, uh, we have a biomanufacturing team which primarily works on sterile fermentation to develop a wide variety of ingredients. I think a consistent question that has been asked is the type of different strains. So in the pilot, as long as it's uh, BSL level one, we engage with most types of strains so, and we are product agnostic. Um, uh, so we have expertise in being able to work with a number of products, um, including uh, biopolymers. Um, I manage the bioresource program. Our focus is primarily on separations and analytics uh, to be able to develop and assist the clients in on the downstream processing side. Um, uh, we have you know, lab scale as well as pilot scale, uh, centrifugation, uh, filtration like microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and uh, RO. Uh, re reverse os osmosis. We also have, as I mentioned before, analytical uh, product characterization capabilities for typical proximate analyses, uh, LC, GPC. Uh, we have also access to instrumentation from Cape Breton University where we can do uh, GCMS, uh, LCMS, et cetera. We work with a number of partners in the ecosystem to be able to uh, provide additional services to our clients. Um, so we work with uh, organizations all across Canada to be able to uh, you know, uh, provide additional uh, capacity than, that, than what we have on site. We work, work with a variety of different feedstocks as well. We have experience with spent green, paper mill waste, uh, you know, food waste uh, from all sorts of industries. Um, like marine uh, processing waste as well as dairy, dairy byproducts, and a number of different applications, um, you know, developing processes for a number of different applications. Um, sorry. Um, as I mentioned before, the biomanufacturing team uh, has lab as well as pilot scale um, sterile fermentation capabilities, uh, one and five liter. Um, uh, scale in the in, for optimization in, at the lab scale. Uh, in the pilot scale, we are in the process of ordering a 30 liter reactor, as well as we have existing capacity for uh, you know sterile thousand liter fermentations, along with the full uh, downstream um, um, uh, suit that is available for uh, product recovery. Uh, we also work with clients to be able to do uh, custom process equipment um, in terms of renting equipment to be able to tailor processes for specialized um, you know, operations. So we have engaged with clients to be able to uh, bring forth equipment that is of uh, specialized need as well. Um, um, we also have a spray dryer on site to be able to uh, pilot scale uh, spray dryer to be able to dry products. Um, and, uh, you know, ion exchange, uh, chromatography, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, a number of different applications, like I mentioned before. Um, my colleague, Pearl, leads the biopolymer team. Uh, we have extrusion capacity at the lab scale uh, currently to be able to uh, do different types of pro product development to uh, we also have material characterization for a variety of physical and mechanical characterization. Uh, uh, and we can also monitor, uh, uh, you know, uh, durability and uh, uh, compostability of these products that are generated. Uh, we have been successful in acquiring a grant for a pilot scale excluder as well, which is uh, currently in, in, in the works, more toys for us to be able to play with. Um, we have uh, uh, the bi BioAg team here whose focus is on uh, develop, uh, engaging with our clients for uh, uh, a number of agriculture-based products. But we, uh, as I mentioned before, have the capacity to do uh, uh, plant trials both at, in, the, in a plant growth room as well as in the greenhouse and a number of array of testing on the uh, different physiological and morphological traits of the uh, of the plants themselves, uh, and have experience testing a number of different um, uh, formulations in, in this regard. 
Um, so with that, I'll end my presentation. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, um, that's it on me. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Subin. Um, so uh, we don't have any questions in the chat immediately. Uh, I'll be curious. Uh, I'd be curious to know a little bit more about um, what kinds of things you are utilizing your BSL two uh, capabilities and laboratory for. Is that is that more strictly in the R and D kind of space, or are you utilizing it for a, as a feeder to commercialization of projects? Uh, it's primarily for R&D capacity. Right now, we have a client uh, currently using the capacity, uh, the BSL2 lab, um, uh, but no, we our pilot facility certainly uh, cannot be used right now for BSL2. So yeah, strictly R&D. Got it. What what percentage then would you say you know just overall uh, of of the of the work that goes on there? is more in that TRL one or two space versus higher level TRLs? Um, in the BSL2 or in general? Uh, just in general. Okay, yeah. Uh, most of the clients that we work with currently are uh, four to six um, uh, in the process of scaling up uh, their process, but uh, uh, a number of clients in the pipeline, especially early stage companies who are looking to be able to further develop their process and um, engage with us and on that front. Um, I, I just want to add that we also have a, a IP policy that enables our clients to be able to hold on to their IP as they are working with us. So, uh, so that there's you know, no, no issue of, uh, uh, you know, IP being lost as a result of working with us. So we are flexible yeah. on that. Okay. All right, fantastic. And I think with that, we can, uh, again, thank you, Subin, and um, move on to the next speaker. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, uh, ABP to you and to everybody um, who is participating in this call. My name is Grant Borden. I am the CEO and founder of Essential. Um, and this presentation is going to possibly feel a little bit different in flavor to some of the um, other folks presenting today because we are a newer organization um, building up biomanufacturing capabilities in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but we're really excited to participate and um, tell you about the seeds that we're planting and um, the partnership opportunities um, on the horizon. Um, so uh, as everybody here knows, because they work on this um, day in and day out, um, there is a... Uh, revolution happening in biology. And we're really looking to use it to create the next generation of cost-effective life-saving solutions to tackle malnutrition, transport food systems, and also improve outcomes in global health more broadly within Sub-Saharan Africa. So most frequently, a lot of the solutions that I think everybody here is familiar with um, are usually applied to and developed for um, OECD markets, so European markets, um, American markets, and there's also other applications here as well. Um, but we really want to be using these capabilities and technologies to create new solutions for Sub-Saharan Africa. And to the best of our knowledge, we're the first folks giving that a shot. Um, I'm going to wrong. I can control the slides, but just not the right directionality of them. This is going to be the right direction. Um, so. Uh, a lot of people here are motivated by things that are close to our heart, um, but just to give you a little bit of, of the sense of the context that we're working in, we are trying to create solutions at the intersection of malnutrition, food systems, and climate. Um, malnutrition affects about a billion people go to sleep hungry every night, and roughly 200 million children suffer from malnutrition. Um, interestingly, nutrition-related factors contribute to nearly half of all under five deaths um, globally. So they're one of the kind of biggest mortality and morbidity causers um, globally. And as everybody here knows, our food systems are one of the biggest drivers of climate change. And increasingly, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, climate change is wrecking agricultural systems and fueling malnutrition. So through the slow burning changes in crop productivity, crop yields, crop nutritional values, as well as um, extreme weather events that kill livestock and destroy crops. Um, climate change is really putting the pressure on these agricultural systems. And this is where we think biomanufacturing proteins as well as other solutions can play a uniquely powerful role. Um, so we are bringing together the talent, expertise, and capabilities to build a bioscience R&D engine in East Africa um, to tackle these problems. Um, 
And core to our belief is that these capabilities that everybody here is using have so much power, but that creating new breakthrough solutions requires you know, designing for cost and context, working with local talent who really deeply understand the problem and putting these solutions and products in front of um, consumers and getting feedback quickly to be able to iterate for these markets. And so that's where we are um, developing and grounding our particular expertise. Um, to give you a sense of, of where we started, we created the first kind of biomanufactured protein in Sub-Saharan Africa, to the best of our knowledge. Um, in the middle of the left slide is um, Essential uh, Chief Technology Officer and co-founder Frey Techea, who um, has spent the past 15 years in biomanufacturing. Um, I'll say more about her, but these are our partners at the um, Addis Ababa Science and Technology University, um, where we're doing some of our lab and benchtop science um, here and in, in creating proteins that we think can really move the dial on these issues that we care about. Um, to give you a sense uh, for the solutions that we're talking about with our proteins, but then most of the other solutions for these contexts, there's both um, commercial paths to scale as well as institutional paths to scale. So for commercial paths to scale, those are traditional retail distribution channels that everybody here is familiar with. And for a lot of the solutions that um, we are working on and want to partner to work on, um, government purchasing as well as um, multilateral agency purchasing for whether it's school feedings or humanitarian products or or the like are um, are particularly relevant here. And we are using um, and starting to understand that landscape of needs to uh, be a good partner in um, understanding these and navigating these markets. Uh, as you saw from the picture before, we are doing benchtop science in Ethiopia with um, academic partners there. We are in the process of building a pilot plant um, in Nairobi, Kenya, um, that will have R&D capabilities and pilot capabilities. I'll say more in a second. But um, to highlight the motivation for working in East Africa it's a, um, is a fewfold. First, the magnitude of the issues that we think that these capabilities have promised to solve um, is huge. Um, second, uh, there's the ability to establish manufacturing capacity. There's excellent local talent. Um, there's a lot of stability, particularly in Kenya, uh, politically, as well as with kind of Forex. Um, and there's a um, growth of kind of market research conducted that there's increasing desirability for these types of products and alternative solutions. Um, one other thing to just note is, you know, um, we're seeing a lot of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly in East Africa, um, increase in economic development, there's larger markets, and by 2050, when you look at the whole continent, um, Af Africa's, you know, estimated to have 2.5 billion people. Um, so there's really is kind of an opportunity to both solve these problems um, and, uh, and develop sustainable solutions. Um, right now, as I mentioned, we are building a pilot plant in uh, Nairobi, where we'll have um, batch top capacities, pilot capacities, um, pilot capabilities that should say we um, have 500 liter bioreactors and we're always already setting up for commercial scale in which we will establish four 50,000 liter bioreactors um, in the coming few years. One area where we are developing a lot of expertise is in understanding how different agricultural byproducts um, can be feedstock um, for kind of different different solutions. Um, and so we're spending, we've spent a lot of time understanding the feedstock landscape locally um, to identify what we can get consistently, reliably, and that provides a path to scale, um, as well as has the chemical composition that we're looking for. Um, we're focusing on aerobic fermentation, but we're building out capabilities beyond that. And our core downstream processing right now is in dewatering, drying, and grinding capabilities um, as well. We have in-house expertise in microbiology, process engineering, um, and product and market analysis um, as well. So kind of uh, that's, that is what we are currently building um, to have. And then the other piece, because this is, I think, probably a, a new market, a new area for a potential partnership for folks here, um, we have a deep bench of contextual expertise. Um, so we are developing key relationships with um, feedstock providers, food companies, um, institutional buyers, and partners across the value chain. Um, and in addition to providing kind of services to do um, uh, to have varied partnerships with folks who come in with scientific solutions. We also want to make sure we are a translator um, of those solutions into local context as well. And so these capabilities are towards that end. Um, in addition to kind of the pilot and production capabilities I just briefly mentioned, um, we also are in-housing expertise, particularly in food science and product development, um, since this, I think, eases adoption for a lot of solutions into the market. Um, and we want to bring some of these buyers um, along to the partnerships that we develop with folks here around the table. 
Um, we also have kind of expertise in regulatory policy and finance. So um, specifically, that, that means we've got established relationships with key government officials um, and multilateral partners um, on the regulatory and policy side. And we are partners who work to um, develop and deliver grant applications um, and for philanthropic funding to do R&D as well as kind of next stage work um, and have established relationships with a number of financing partners on um, the philanthropic and public financing side. Um, this is just a quick overview of the leadership team. I'm, I'm, uh, my background is in developing um, new innovations, particularly malnutrition and um, other global health areas in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Fred Tate, who I mentioned briefly, is the CTO and co-founder. She's worked in biomanufacturing for the past 18 years in the Bay Area. Um, prior to coming to Essential, she was the director of fermentation at Culture Biosciences. Um, and then Taylor Quinn is leading our product development on the food side um, and has developed um, and spun out many successful food products and food companies in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, gives you a taste of a little bit of what we're doing um, in terms of a first focus on leveraging these capabilities for proteins, but we are looking for opportunities across project areas and are really interested in um, developing kind of uh, new solutions in partnership with folks um, for these markets to tackle these issues. Um, please feel free to reach out to me or Frey. Um, you can see our emails here. Um, we're keen to explore all different sorts of collaboration and, and think about how we can use these technologies to create groundbreaking solutions for um, the world's poor. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Um, <clears throat> I, I was curious uh, to to just ask you the question of perhaps uh, is there a um, sort of a, an emergent type of of partner that you see as as a kind of a a model of of how folks can wrap their heads around the best ways to think about partnering with with your group. Um, that's a great question. I would say we're still early days, and so we're open to a lot of different partnership models. The advantage is we are agile and flexible um, and have these capabilities. And so um, want to hear from you in terms of what um, partnership capability or what partnership models work. I'll say this, um, both me and my co-founder Frey have worked in partnership models um, across our careers for the past you know, 15 plus years um, with other organizations. And I think we are, um, tries uh, essential on being effective, efficient, and collaborative partners. Um, and we're looking for people who, I would say, and in, in, in institutions who are um, interested in really tackling major global problems in these markets and um, working to leverage the capabilities and technologies um, you all have to do so. And we want to be the partner that kind of helps um, map out those opportunities and, and make them real. Okay, great. Um, I, I, I noticed that you referenced some data through um, research that had taken place through World Health Organization and, and other types of uh, or, or sort of NGOs uh, and, and, and wonder if there's they sort of serve as a, a, a bridge, if you will, to other groups. So is there is there some interstitial tissue kind of role that NGOs play for you? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um... Uh, so we, um, NGOs most frequently in these spaces are the frontline service delivery providers um, when there's not state capacity or commercial markets that are viable. Um, and so in those situations, we are working with, you know, NGOs to integrate the solutions that we have into um, their services. And that, you know, ranges from obviously the proteins that we're talking about here to, you know, there's many NGOs focused on um, for example, delivering, you know, agricultural products to small scale farmers across sub-Saharan Africa and always keen to think about like what are new biofertilizers that could be being used or new products that could be improving um, kind of, you know, productivity and yield in that space. And so we've got those partnerships there. Um, I would say maybe just backing out and to kind of put a, another layer on that, you know, we started with proteins um, in, in, in part because um, one way that we think about this is you know, the alternative protein space in the United States and Europe largely, but not only, has frequently been trying to solve the problem of how do you get wealthy people in those contexts to not eat animals for very, very good reasons. Um, and we think that underlying science can help tackle malnutrition in sub-Saharan Africa and, and across low and middle income countries. And we see across a lot of the product and solution spaces happening in the biosciences and biomanufacturing right now, 
that a lot of that underlying science that's being used to serve these wealthier markets can, coupled with you know, some additional R&D adaptation and contextualization, really solve problems in these other contexts. And so are particularly powerful um, there. Excellent. OK, well, great work. And thank you again, Grant, for presenting. And with that, we have a break coming up.